But it's good to be here in San Francisco again this morning. And in fact, the lesson that I've prepared today is a lesson that I've been thinking about since the last time I was here, about a month ago. Um, it, it, sometimes, you know, lessons, just, you know, sort of come out of the, out of, out of nowhere, it seems, and, uh, you know, I, they don't take all that much time to prepare, but this is actually one that I started thinking about when I was last here, um, and I have been thinking about and working on and, and tinkering with uh, the entire time that, uh, that I have been away from you in order to, to prepare it this morning. I'm going to warn you right now, it's a hard lesson. It's a tough, challenging lesson that contains a number of tough, challenging lessons. So just be prepared for that just right off the top. And you would probably get the sense of that as soon as you see the title. Go ahead, Jay, and put up the first title card here. I've titled this lesson, Lazarus Stinks. And you, you remember, of course, the story of Lazarus, uh, the man that Jesus resurrects from the dead. And you'll remember probably, if you know the story, the, the, the line that happens when Jesus arrives at the grave and tells him to open the grave uh, because he's about to resurrect Lazarus. And, you know, the comment is, well, Lord, you know, he's been in there four days. You know, it's going to stink if we do that. Uh, but the reason I've given this lesson this title is because there's hard lessons coming, and I just want you to be prepared for that. Lazarus is synonymous with resurrection. And even a lot of people who don't know anything about the Bible associate the name Lazarus with the idea of somebody coming back from the dead. There have been hundreds of stories and books and movies and TV shows and songs that use Lazarus as a metaphor for resurrection or, or coming back to life. In fact, even scientists use the name Lazarus that way. The term Lazarus taxon is used by paleontologists to talk about a species that appears to go extinct for a long period of time. In other words, there are fossils of it and then we don't find fossils of it in the fossil record for a very long time, and then all of a sudden it reappears. They call that a Lazarus taxon or Lazarus species. And in medicine, the Lazarus sign is a muscle reflex that is sometimes exhibited by patients who are clinically considered brain dead, where the arms come up and fold across the chest um, just reflexively. And that's called the Lazarus sign or the Lazarus reflex. So even for people who don't have a lot of familiarity with the Bible or who are not believers, that name Lazarus implies resurrection, coming back from the dead. But for us as people of faith, the fact that Lazarus comes back from the dead provides an important proof. It's as part of the account of Lazarus's return that Jesus makes the statement in John chapter 11 verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then Jesus demonstrates the truth of those words by raising Lazarus from the dead, a man who has been in the grave for four days. John records the event as Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take the grave clothes off and let him go. A man who had been dead for four days comes back to life at the word of Jesus. Usually when we think about Lazarus, we think about Jesus being resurrection and life. And that's a powerful and joyful lesson. Because who doesn't want to embrace 
the promise that's in those words, I am the resurrection and the life. Who doesn't find hope in the proof of those words as provided by a man four days dead emerging from the grave? Who doesn't find joy in the thought that if Jesus could restore Lazarus to life, then he has the power to restore all of us to life, even though we pass into death before his glorious return, as is promised in the scriptures. That's usually the lesson we derive from the story of Lazarus. That's a great lesson, and it's an easy one to receive and to embrace. However, there are some other lessons in the story of Lazarus we sometimes miss. Lessons that are also important, but lessons that we find more difficult to enthusiastically embrace, which is why we pass over them on the way to resurrection and life at the end of the story. The account of Lazarus reveals some principles that are critical to our accurate understanding of our relationship with God. And perhaps more significantly, of God's relationship with us. And we're going to look this morning at some of those hard principles to embrace. But let's first go back to the very beginning of John's account. In John chapter 11, which is the chapter that mostly is covered by the story of Lazarus. John begins by writing this. He says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. If we drop down now to verse 11, John continues. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. So that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, or the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. There had been some discussion about the fact that if Jesus went to Bethany, his enemies might seize him and kill him. And that's what Thomas is alluding to, that if, if they go to Bethany, Jesus may, may lose his life. And Thomas expresses his willingness to die along with Jesus. Here's what I want us to think about as we think about this beginning part of the story. Because here's the first hard lesson. God does not always re respond the way we think God should. Mary and Martha sent word to Lazarus, to Jesus, telling them, Lord, the love, one you love is sick. What do we think they expected Jesus would do when he heard that? Well, 
it's reasonable to think that they thought if Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he would come and make him better. And we know that that's what they were thinking because both of the sisters say that when Jesus arrives. In verse 21, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The implication being, Lord, the whole reason we told you he was sick was so that you would come and he wouldn't die. And in case we thought that thought was unique to Martha, notice verse 32, Mary says the exact same words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha and Mary, when they sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, expected that Jesus would respond by coming to Bethany and making their brother better. But as we read, he didn't. Not only did he not come right away, he stayed where he was for another two days. God does not always respond the way we think God should. How many times in your life have you prayed for a certain thing to happen and just the opposite happened? Happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you at some point. God doesn't always do what we think God ought to do. That's a hard lesson for us to embrace. Because we think God should always do what we think God should do. We think God should always respond to our entreaty in the way that we would, or at least we think we would if we were God. And God doesn't always do that. And sometimes we get frustrated by that. Sometimes we get angry about that. Remember Jonah. God told him, go to preach to Nineveh. And they will repent of their evil ways. And Jonah didn't want to go and preach to Nineveh. Because he didn't like the people in Nineveh. And he would rather God punish them than that they repent and God forgive them. And so Jonah didn't go at first. Remember, he got on a boat and sailed off into the west. A storm came up. He knew why. He persuaded the sailors to throw him overboard and a fish swallowed him. He spent three days in that fish. When he got out of the fish, Jonah went and preached to Nineveh. And exactly what God predicted happened. The people heard, they embraced the word of God, and they turned away from the path that they had been walking. And God forgave them. And Jonah got so mad about that, you remember, that he went and sat under a vine. And the vine died. taking away the shade, making Jonah sit in the sun. And God said, well, that's your fault. God doesn't always do what we think God should do. He doesn't always respond to our requests the way that we think that he should. That's a hard lesson. It was a lesson that Mary and Martha had to come to terms with. Sometimes you say, God, our brother's sick. And your brother dies anyway. Second hard lesson that we see in this account 
is that God's timetable does not respond, correspond to our own. When Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed for two days in the place where he was. When Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that their brother was sick, they didn't expect him to sit there for 48 hours before he took the first step toward Bethany. But that's what he did. They thought he would immediately get up and rush to the place where Lazarus was. But he didn't. How many times in your life have you prayed for something urgently? God, I need this right now. And you didn't get it right now. It didn't happen right then. Maybe it didn't happen for quite a long time. What seems urgent to us is not always urgent to God. Because our perception of time is different from God's perception of time. We think about time in terms of our own lives, which are limited. You know, we know that in terms of this life, we are not going to be here forever. And yet, the scripture tells us, first in the 90th Psalm and the 4th verse, and then Peter quotes that passage in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, that to God, a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. God doesn't think about time the way that we do. What seems to us like something that needs to happen right now, God doesn't perceive it that way. Remember that in the time in which the New Testament scriptures were being written, nearly 2,000 years ago, Christians prayed what? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Been 2,000 years, right? He hasn't come yet. To us, that seems like, well, that's a long wait. To God, what? A thousand years like a day. A day like a thousand years. To God, that's, that's not a long time. It's only a long time to us because our lives and therefore our perception of time are limited in this life. But it's hard for us to understand and embrace the idea that God doesn't work on time the way that we see time. When I ask God for something, I expect it now. God's now and my now are two completely different things. And sometimes that's a difficult thing to wrestle with. The third hard lesson that we draw from this account is that God's perspective on things is greater than my individual situation. Remember that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he told his disciples, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory. So that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus' purpose all along was for Lazarus to die so that he could raise him up and glorify God by so doing. To demonstrate the power of God by raising a man who had been dead for four days. That's what mattered to Jesus. Was glorifying the Father. Not the immediate health needs of Lazarus. 
not the emotional concerns of his two sisters. Those things were important to God, but God had something bigger in mind. That Mary and Martha and the disciples of Jesus could not see, but that God could. God knew, Jesus knew, that the death of Lazarus would provide an opportunity to demonstrate the power of God so that those who saw it and those who would read about it later, like us, could glorify God as a result. That's something that the people living in that moment had a hard time seeing. But that happens in our own lives too. Sometimes I can't understand why something is happening to me. I can't understand why I'm going through this difficulty. I can't understand why the world around me is the way it is. But that's because I can't see things the way that God sees. I don't have his perspective. I can't see where things fit into what his plans might be. I can only see how I feel and what I want and what my expectations are. And those are infinitesimally small compared to the universal perspective that God possesses. That's a hard thing to understand. And it's a hard thing to embrace. That my concerns are not the most important thing to God. Because I think they should be. I think whatever I want should be number one on God's to-do list. But sometimes what I want is so far down God's to-do list as to be off the list. Because God can see things and knows things and understands things that I do not and cannot. And that's a hard thing sometimes to embrace. The fourth hard lesson from this story is that what we want is not always what God is offering. Jesus tells his disciples, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Do you get that? Jesus, first of all, says Lazarus is dead. And then he says, you know what? I'm glad I wasn't there to heal him. I'm glad I wasn't there to save him. I'm glad I wasn't there to fix the problem because I'm going to show you something that's bigger than Lazarus getting better. Lazarus' sisters did not want their brother to die. We know that because they both said that, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. Mary and Martha did not want Lazarus to die. Jesus' disciples did not want their friend, Lazarus, in whose home they stayed every time they were in Bethany. They did not want their friend to die. We're not told what was going on in Lazarus' mind, but I'm guessing if he's like the rest of us, he didn't want to die. But Lazarus' death is what God had to offer because it fulfilled his purpose. I am glad for your sake I was not there, Jesus says, so that you might believe. How many times do we see that narrative in Scripture? Remember Job? Job. 
Job, the man who lost everything, lost his property, and he had great wealth, lost his family, and he had a large family, even lost the health of his body. Job didn't want any of that. Job did not wake up one day and say, man, I hope robbers come and, and kill my servants and take my flocks and herds. Hope an accident happens and the house collapses and kills my kids. Man, I hope I get boils all over my body today. Job didn't want any of that. But that's what was on his plate that day. That's what God allowed. What we want is not always what God's offering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul writes about his thorn in the flesh, as he calls it. The, the chronic physical affliction that he suffered. We have no idea what that was. A lot of people have speculated. But the, the real answer is we don't know what that affliction was. But it was serious enough that Paul called it a thorn in his flesh. And he says, three times I prayed to God about this. The implication being, you know, I thought God would fix this the first time I asked him. And he didn't. So I asked him again in case maybe he didn't hear it that first time. And it didn't get better. And so a third time I said, Lord, please remove this. And God's answer to Paul was, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you can pray all you want. But this problem you have, I'm not taking it away. I've given you the grace to deal with it. I've given you the strength to bear up with it. To keep going in spite of it. And you're just going to have to be okay with that. That was not what Paul wanted. But that's what God was offering. Has that ever happened in your life? It's happened in mine. What I wanted was not what God had to give. I had to learn to be okay with that. That's what happens in life. Sometimes people get frustrated with God. Because what God has to give is not what they want. Sometimes people leave their faith altogether because what God has to give is not what they want. But what we have to understand is God is not always about what we want. And Sometimes we just have to be okay with that. But here's the fifth lesson. And this is one that we probably struggle with more than all of the others combined. And that is the truth of the fact that our suffering does not mean that God does not love us. Twice, John points out the love that Jesus has for, had for Lazarus and his family. Even as Jesus was dealing with his disciples over the fact that Lazarus was sick and we're not going right now, John stops in the narrative in verse 5 and says, Now Jesus loved Martha. 
and her sister and Lazarus. The Holy Spirit writing through John in that moment wants us to understand the reason that Jesus didn't go was not because he didn't love Martha and Mary and Lazarus. He did love them. The fact that he didn't go and make Lazarus better didn't change the fact that he loved them. A love that was so evident that when Jesus arrives at the grave of Lazarus, in the 35th verse, John writes the shortest, yet one of the most powerful verses in the entirety of Scripture. Jesus wept. And those who stood by observing said, see how he loved him. What is Jesus weeping about? He knows he's going to bring Lazarus back. He knows the end of the story. Why is Jesus weeping at the grave of Lazarus when he knows he's going to fix it all and make it better? Because in that moment, Jesus is heartbroken. Because in order to glorify his father, he had to let his friend die. In order to glorify God, Jesus, knowing what was going to happen if he didn't go, stayed for two days in the place where he was. And he's standing there at the grave confronting the fact that I've let my friend die. I've let his sisters and all of these people who are here be heartbroken because Lazarus has died and I loved him and do love him and I love them and will always love them. But this was a thing I had to do to glorify my Father in heaven. The fact that Jesus let Lazarus die did not mean he didn't love him. The fact that he let Lazarus die did not mean he didn't love Mary and Martha. Or his disciples who also loved their friend. When Job lost everything, God loved him. When David lost the child that was born of his adultery with Bathsheba, Ten days after the child was born. God loved David. A man whom he said was a man after his own heart. And yet that child died. God loved his servant Paul. Despite the fact that he was suffering with some grievous physical ailment that troubled him greatly. And God didn't take it away. But God still loved him. God loved his only begotten son. even though he died on a cross. Even as his son nailed to that tree is crying out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani! My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God still loved him. 
and God loves us. Even though sometimes he doesn't fix our problems. Even though sometimes he doesn't relieve our suffering in the way we think he should. Even though sometimes he lets us bear through difficult, challenging things that we know he has the power to fix if he would. But it's not his plan to do so. But it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. Because he always loves us. These five lessons are hard to hear. They are certainly challenging to embrace. It is hard to know that God doesn't always respond we think he should. It is hard to know that God doesn't work on the same timetable that we do. It is hard to know that when we see our individual situation being what it is, that God has a bigger perspective that may not include doing what we want. It is hard to know that what we want is not always what God has to offer in a particular moment, in a particular situation. And it is particularly hard to get our heads around the fact that God allowing us at times to suffer does not mean he doesn't love us. But what do these lessons teach us? What do we gain from these lessons? First of all, we learn that God does not think or act as we do. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, God says that. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As if the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We can't understand the ways of God beyond what he has chosen to reveal. And we can't always understand why he's chosen to reveal some things and not reveal others. But what we do have to know is that God just isn't like us. God created us in his image. We did not create God in ours. And we forget that sometimes. Sometimes we forget God is not Santa Claus. God is not a jolly old man whose only purpose in life is to bring us stuff that we want. Sometimes that's what people think God is. That is not God. There's nothing in scripture that would lead you to believe that that's who God is. Remember what he said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. You want more? You've got all I want you to have. You want something you do not now possess? This is what I've given you. That is sufficient for you. For my power... God said to Paul, is made perfect in weakness. How would it make you strong, God is saying, for me to give you everything you want? My power 
is strong in you when you rely on me even when you are at your weakest. When you are struggling with it, whatever thorn is in your flesh. <coughs> to trust in God to give you the ability to bear through it. To keep going in spite of it. To deal with it. Because sometimes we forget we exist to serve God. God does not exist to serve us. Our purpose is to do for God. God's purpose is not to do for us. When God does do for us, it is because it is God's will to do so. Not because he is in any way obligated or compelled or constrained. God in giving us the, the gift of his son has already given us everything we could ever ask for. The hope and promise of eternal life. Anything else he gives us is just gravy on the biscuit. Solomon would write in Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter and the 13th verse, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. The sum total of our existence is to fear God and keep his commandments. The sum total of God's existence is not Fear humankind and do what they say. That is not on God's agenda. Our agenda is to do what God has called us to do. But let's also remember that even in our toughest times, God always loves us and cares for us. Peter in 1 Peter the 5th chapter in the 6th verse writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. If we maintain our trust in God, He will lift us up. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not even in the, within the limitations of this mortal life. But in due time, in His time, He will exalt us. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, in the 5th verse, said, Be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Whatever it is we have in the moment, it is what God wants us to have right now. It may not be what we want. God has better things for us, but maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not in this life. But in the life to come, eternal glory. And he loved us and cared enough for us to provide that hope by allowing his precious son to die on the cross for us. I said at the beginning of the lesson, the story of Lazarus stinks. That whole resurrection of life part is great, but look at all this other stuff. These are hard lessons. These are tough things to swallow. 
And yet, as we consider them, they help us to understand better, whether we like it or not, our relationship with God. And again, more importantly, God's relationship to us. I hope that as you consider these things, as you go about your week, that maybe it'll give you some fresh perspective on why that thing that you keep hoping will get better doesn't. Why God doesn't always do the things you think he ought to or that you ask him to. And you can stop asking yourself the question, well, if I'm suffering like this, does this mean God doesn't love me? No. doesn't mean that at all. Any more than it meant that he didn't love his son when he suffered and died on the cross. He loved him greatly, but he had a bigger plan. And that plan was ultimately to provide eternity for us.